there is sort of just an extraordinary difference if you're in a place where you, you just feel it's growing versus not. Yeah. And, it, and uh, there, there's a sense in which uh, Florida, Texas have this, um, have this dynamic of where it's just growing, you know, every, every storefront is full, there are no empty stores, you know, everything, it's not, I'm not sure it's quite booming, but it feels, you know, it feels healthy and growing. And then, um, and then you know, much of California does not quite have that feel, even though, of course, you know, Sil- Silicon Valley's been this odd place where it was a, um, you know, gold rush and everyone was depressed. Yeah. <laughs> even so, for the last decade. So the, the, the Silicon Valley had a very odd dynamic where it was a, a crazy boom that, that didn't actually feel that way if you, you know, walk down the street. <laughs> I'm Dave Rubin, live from the local studio here in Miami, and joining me today is the founder of the Teal Foundation, the co-founder of PayPal and Palantir, Peter Teal. I could have given you like a whole bigger intro there. Anything else you want to throw in yourself? It's all good. G- generally, the shorter the intro, the more flattering it is. You, oh. have, you have super long, you have a 20-page resume for people who've never done anything. So well, I was going to say, a short Renaissance more man, disgruntled libertarian something. The longer something. the intro gets, the, the more it suggests that you're not really doing anything at all. Oh, all right. Well, you are doing a lot. I have. I actually have notes. I never have notes when I do a show, but I was like, I want to cover some new ground and not just get into the, the political mm-hmm. thing that we're always fighting uh, with everybody about. Uh, but I thought I'd start because we are here in Miami. Uh, you know, you famously left San Francisco, moved most of the operation to Los Angeles. You do have a place in Miami. Um, how do you feel about this sort of movement of people across the country right now and, and sort of watching people migrate to different places to live very, very different ways? Well, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's surely a very healthy thing that, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's in retrospect, it's amazing that people were as stuck as they were in the places they were they were in for for such a long time. And you know, the the history of the U.S. was that this had always been a society where people moved a lot between places, and and the mobility, um, the physical mobility, had actually gone down probably a lot for the last forty or fifty years relative to the you know two hundred year history before that. And so, uh, and you know, it's 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 probably the jury's still a little bit out whether this is a temporary or permanent feature, but it's, it's, it's surely a healthy recalibration. It's, it's sort of this idea you can always start over in this country, um, and one of the ways you start over is you move to a new place. Were you kind of patting yourself on the back that you were the first guy out of San Francisco, and my audience is well aware, as I've posted some videos from a recent visit to San Francisco, the way that place has just collapsed under progressive policies is, is absolutely insane. I'm guessing you don't have any employees that are wishing that you guys had stayed, although you still do have some people there, right? Uh, there still are some people, not, not very many, that still are, are living in San Francisco uh, proper. Uh, and uh, yeah, it is, it is really extraordinary. I lived, I lived in San Francisco from 2003 to 2000, 2018, and uh, it sort of, you know, it never quite got better. But the idea, it took a while for the idea to sneak up on people that it was actually on the slow decay deterioration thing. You know, the, the homelessness was always a chronic problem. But in circa 2014, 2015, you, you started to realize, you know, it's actually getting worse. And they're never gonna, it's not just that this is this fake problem that they're taking a long time to fix. It's they are, it's a fake problem they use to distract from everything else. They're never gonna fix it. So when you when you're here, I mean, it's in also Florida, a real problem. You know? it, well, it's also right. It's it's clearly a real problem, but something that they either don't seem interested in fixing. Well, what do you think well, is the answer both, to that? Is there it lo- that they're the, not the, interested? There are a lot of problems that are yeah. both real and fake. Yeah. So the homeless problem is, you know, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's an incredible problem, but um, it also you get a sense that it never gets fixed. And so if you if you talk about a problem that you're never going to fix, then you can avoid talking about all the other problems, <laughs> like let's say cost of living for. Um, out of control rents for people with homes, or um, broken schools, or you know, crime, or you know, there sort of are probably half a dozen other issues that uh, move to the bottom of the queue. As long as we talk about an unsolvable problem. When you were there, were you trying to talk to them about those things and say, guys, like, look at what is happening here and 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 the state of the decay? Well, on the on the on the city level, it felt it felt like uh, exit is much more powerful than voice. Yeah. You know, it is. Uh, it was. Uh, I'm not sure it's super corrupt, but uh, uh, San Francisco is super ideological in this uh, very left-wing, mm-hmm. very uh, unreformable way. And, uh, and uh, no, it would be, 
you know, it's, it's, I always have a schizophrenic view about getting involved in, in politics, where it's, it's like super important and super toxic. But, yeah. uh, but getting involved in uh, San, Francisco, San Francisco city politics, uh, that would be that would be absolutely an insane thing to do relative to just moving. You're not enough of a masochist for that. It's, it's uh, you know, I'm, I'm, heroism's good, martyrdom not so good, and uh, and uh, and yeah, the the relative uh, the relative sanity of getting involved in local politics or just moving out of San Francisco, you should always move. So to that point, one more thing on this. Um, so now you're here in Florida, you know, you have for a place the, here. For the winter, for, last, for the winter. Last few winters, So you're yes. split in time and obviously you also have your place in LA, uh, but do you feel a, a real tangible difference when you're here? I mean, you know, I left a year ago and it's like, I have not looked back and mm-hmm. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm loving it here and I see something so incredibly uh, powerful and flourishing here. Do you feel that when you're here? Uh, well, it, it has, you know, there is there is sort of just an extraordinary difference if you're in a place where you you just feel it's growing versus not, yeah. and and uh, there there's a sense in which uh, Florida Texas have this um, have this dynamic of where it's just growing. You know, every every storefront is full. There are no empty stores. You know, everything. It's not. I'm not sure it's quite booming, but it feels you know it feels healthy and growing. And then um, and then you know. Much of California does not quite have that feel, even though, of course, you know, Sil- Silicon Valley has been this odd place where it was a, um, you know, gold rush and everyone was depressed. Yeah. <laughs> even so, for the last decade. So, the, the, the Silicon Valley had a very odd dynamic, where it was a, a crazy boom that, that didn't actually feel that way if you, you know, walk down the street. And then, uh, and then certainly with a, with the COVID shock, the last few years, uh, it's quite different. I, I still think California. Is, is probably somewhat healthier than New York or you know completely bankrupt states like Illinois or you know non states like Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. But, uh, Wh- but why, do, why sh- do you think healthier than New York? I think um, I think the I think there are ways that the the finance industry that New York is centered on is more movable than the tech industry in mm-hmm. California, and probably the very big tech companies like uh, Google and Apple. Um, it's it's hard to picture them actually moving out of California, whereas you can um, you can pick the, you can picture the big banks gradually moving out of New York and and certain and and there's something about finance that's been a little bit more movable. It also paradoxically makes it more dangerous for California because um, if things ever go wrong, they will be so bust. It'll right. be like it'll be like Detroit, which thought that it had these captive big three car manufacturers and uh, could get away with very bad policies in Michigan, Detroit. For decade after decade, and then when you know when that industry finally went south, you know it was it was just unfixable. So the, do you find so that these... New York uh, New York's in a worse shape right now because people are are you know relatively more people are leaving. It's easier for the businesses to leave, um, and then maybe uh, maybe California if it if it's not careful, you know it, it will at some point really go off the cliff. Right. Do you find that these things sort of happen slowly and then very quickly? So something like California, it's like, you know, Cali's lost almost a million people in these last three years. And a lot of them are high earners. I mean, these are people who are paying into the system that's ever growing. At some point, somebody has to look at numbers, right? And be like, none of this works. You know, or, or I guess maybe not, right? It just continues somehow, I suppose. Yeah. yeah I, I, I actually, I don't know how many of them were the highest earners in California the last last few years. I think New York was was a little bit more that effect than than California. Uh, but yes, these things, you know, um, we have these odd dynamics where things go on for a very long time. They're not ultimately sustainable, but you know, there's, you know, there's some, there's some way. I often think that much of the 2000s and 2010s were this weird continuation of the 1990s. You know, the decades. There were things that happened. You know, you had 9/11. You had the global financial crisis, Trump election, Brexit. There were, there were some events that happened in those 20 years, but it was surprisingly little. December 2019, I was reflecting on the 2010s, and I, I, I realized there have been no retrospectives on this decade. And what actually happened in the hmm. 2010s? You know, we had marijuana legalization, we had Game of Thrones, yeah. and people <laughs> fell into their iPhones, and right. uh, and then, uh, but then it was somehow just this this thing that was sort of a stretched, exhausted version of the 2000s, which themselves were a stretched, exhausted version of, of the 90s, and then, uh, and then I, yeah, I, I want to say that. In some sense, you know, March 2020, when COVID hits, um, we finally, you know, uh, a lot of these things finally 
accelerate and, so, so, and you know, um, and uh, we're finally in the 21st century. If you're looking for a more unfiltered lens into the world of tomorrow, check out our tech playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a wide variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.